Um, my name's Margaret and I've been involved in the Climate Challenge Project, the CCF project at Bannockburn House and so you all know CCF is the Climate Challenge Fund and it was set up by the Scottish Government expressly to encourage um, communities to grow food with a view to also educating the community to the fact that if we grow our food locally it's not travelling as far so it's not um, running up air miles and carbon emissions and things like that so that's where the climate challenge aspect comes into it but we also want you to understand that growing food can be fun and it can be tasty and it can be really delicious so um, without sounding too much like Margareta Thunberg I'm going to pass you over to Kate now and Kate will just um, introduce us in the talk and we'll go from there. Okay over to you Kate. Hi, my screen's totally black. Is everybody else's screen totally black? Or is this just my computer? I've got the I've got the um the beginning of the presentation. Okay, it must just be my computer. Fine, I'll just talk at a black screen. So we're going to go through today um just some of the things you might have come across when growing your uh, vegetables. Um, some of you might be new to it and some of you might be super experienced. Um, so this isn't, we're not going to manage to cover everything that you might have come across. Um, but this is just a few hints and tips to help you get the most out of um, growing veg in your gardens and hopefully give you a few pointers for carrying on into the autumn. So I'll pass over to Margaret and she's going to start with some of the basics. So... Have we got the first uh, slide there then, Ross? Yeah. So weeding and watering, I think most people know a little bit about weeding and watering, but let me just quickly go through that. Um, what is a weed? Well, a weed is a plant growing in the wrong place, basically. It could be anything. You know, if you plant a row of carrots and some dandelions decide to start growing in it, then really that's a weed as far as you're concerned. Um, and what you'll find is weeds are quite often more vigorous than the plants you're trying to grow. So... They'll steal the light, they'll steal the water, they'll steal the food, they'll steal the space, more importantly, for the roots and, the, for example, your beetroot or your carrots so that they can expand in the soil. So we'd set up competition and so we want to get rid of them as quickly as possible. And it's always best to try and get weeds when they're tiny, get them when they're little. It's much easier to get rid of them if you just kind of lightly disturb the soil, then you'll find that you've uprooted these tiny little seedlings and they should just dehydrate if it's a warm sunny day. Um, if you've not had a chance to get the weeds out and they're getting quite big, then your next damage limitation is to make sure that they don't set seeds. So if you can't do anything else, just chop the flowers off, gather them up, put them in the bin. But if you let them set seed, then there's an old folks tale that says, an old wife's tale that says, one year's seeding is seven years weeding. So you know, if they set seed and then sprinkle the seeds on your garden, you could be pulling them out for seven years. So it's best to get in as quickly as possible with the weeds. Um, watering. Now, plants need water. The, the seeds usually don't germinate unless they've got water. The plant uses water <coughs> excuse me, to move the food around inside the plant. And it uses water to support itself because if the stems, if the cells in the stem and things like that are not turgid, then the plant can't stand up and it can't hold itself up to get the sunlight to help it photosynthesize. So how do we water? Right, how do we know? How do we know it's going to water? Well, stick your finger in the soil. That's the first thing. Just stick your finger in about half an inch, move the top soil out of the way ever so slightly. Stick your finger in and if it feels dry and dusty, then yeah, your plant probably needs water. But if it feels quite moist, then you can probably leave it for another day or so. Now, a lot of people think they have to go out water their garden every single day. Um, no, you don't really need to do that unless, you know, you're living in the Sahara Desert or something like that. Um, the most important thing with weeding is to give the plant enough water and to give it at the point where it can get the most use from it. So if you stand in the garden with a great big hose sprinkling over everything, you'll find the water is just going to go on the leaves and drip down a wee bit onto the soil. Whereas if you actually get your hose and get it right in at the root of the plant, get it in where the stem's coming out of the soil, that's probably your best place to to get the water into the plant. So um, best to water early in the morning because then the plant's got the benefit, it'll soak up all that water and use it for the whole day. You could water in the evening, but um, particularly in, late, in early spring and late autumn, you're gonna find that the temperature will drop at night time. And so your little plant's sitting there with cold, wet feet and nobody likes cold, wet feet. So don't water it in the middle of the day because it's gonna be so hot or certainly gonna be warmer 
and the water should just evaporate really and you'll not get as much of a benefit from them. So when I went back, when I was talking to you about um, sprinkling everything with a hose, you know, you want to be really careful. You don't want to get water on the leaves because um, if you see little raindrops sitting on the leaf and then the sun comes out, then it can act like a little magnifying glass and it can burn the leaf. So that's not a good idea. But also if your plants are growing really close together and it's very humid and you get the leaves wet and everything like that, you, you can get mildew, um, which is a kind of white powdery fungus that grows across the plant and the flower buds and the vegetables and everything like that. And it can actually start them rotting. So have a look on Google, see what mildew looks like if you're not sure what it is. And if you think you've got mildew, then try and remove it and try and improve the ventilation around your plant and remove that. And another thing, just quickly, if you've got your plants in pots and you're not sure if it's going to need water, then lift the pot up. And if it's really light, then you know probably the soil's getting dry and it needs water. But if it's, and particularly, you know, the plant might be wilting, it might be saying to you, I need water. But it could be that the plant's got too much water and it could be wilting then as well. So if you pick up the plant and it's really heavy, then sometimes if you tip it on your side, you might, on its side, you might get shock, the amount of water that comes out because the plant's waterlogged. Um, this is particularly with house plants. Um, what else can I say about watering? Just don't water them every day. Water them maybe every two or three days and make sure you give them a really good drink, but not every day. So I think, I think that's me kind of covered watering. Um, I'll pass you over to Kate and she can do the next couple of slides. Okay, dokie. Um, I'm going to have to work from rings. I've gone white and I can't see anything. So I think on this slide, a pair of um, some radishes. And uh, Margaret, what do you please? Right, this one is observe what's going on. Yes, yeah, so it's got a picture of, some, uh, of the radishes and what else is on there? Oh, it's got a picture of the potatoes with the, the leaves oh, going up. Okay, yeah. thank you so much. Okay, so this is... Some of you, to start with, had some problems with the compost um, and you were noticing this because um, things weren't growing properly or the leaves were slightly deformed. So this is basically, if you think something looks weird and it doesn't take long to work out what looks normal and what doesn't, then there probably is something amiss. Um, and this could take the form of um, leaves looking um, oddly shaped or oddly coloured um, or the growth habit just looks uh, very different. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, Ross, please. So the next slide shows um, some things that, that you might see. So um, things such as radishes and lettuce can quite often bolt. So there's a picture of this on the left-hand side of the radishes where they've shot up um, and they're actually going about, about to start to flower. Um, and this is something that happens when temperature changes or day length changes. And it's actually just the plant trying to set seed um, with the radishes. Those radishes would now be quite woody and quite bitter. So possibly not very nice to eat. So if you saw with lettuces, however, you could still pick and use the leaves, but you're probably looking at taking them out the garden pretty quickly and probably re-sowing. And then another thing that we started to see in the tatties uh, just this last couple of weeks yeah. um, was the leaves curling, uh, the top leaves curling. Um, and it looks like um, it, it's just shriveling up a little bit. And if we go to the next slide, I think we've got the picture of... Um, yeah, the one that we were just on, sorry. We're just, if you go back to that other slide there, Ross. Um, it's showing you the, bl the black leg, is that what you're So if yeah. you see the leaves of your tatty starting to shrivel up, at this time of year, um, it's probably not going to be blight yet, but it could be something called black leg, where it's a bacteria coming on the seed tatties themselves, the ones that you planted, um, and particularly as the weather gets wetter, it causes this rot at the base of the stem. And so if you see something like that, then you need to take out the whole plant because you don't want it sort of staying in the soil and spreading. Can yeah. we have the next slide, please, Ross? Margaret, can you remind me what's on the no, next slide? Right. It's the next one after that, Ross, because we've done the bolted radish now and the aphid damage on the char. Um, yeah. Well, the next slide is the signs that the potatoes are ready for harvesting. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to talk about the chard and the, the aphid damage well, on the chard? You might be seeing that on your beetroot or maybe on some of the leafy crops. Go back uh, one, Ross, sorry. 
Sorry. Well, you, well, thanks, Margaret. <laughs> I yeah, can't see. Sorry about this. Yeah, it's, it's flying blind, isn't it? That's the one now, yeah. So you might be seeing on some of your leafy things. So it could you could be seeing it on chard, on radish leaves, on lettuce leaves. Um, little sort of pinpricks of holes, mottled colours. And this is just sap, sap sucking insects. That's quite a tongue twister. Having a meal. Uh, aphids, it could be leaf hoppers, any of these things. So it might look a bit unsightly, but for these uh, leafy crops, it's still absolutely fine for you to eat. And unless you get a really severe infestation of aphids, um, you're probably not going to have to do anything about it. Um, hopefully all the bugs and beasties in your garden are going to feed on them and um, control them naturally. Um, so yeah, that's just a few things to look out for. And maybe if you've seen something different in your crops, we can have a chat about it at the end. I'll pass over to Margaret to talk yeah. about harvesting patties. Harvesting potatoes. So we're on to slide six now, Ross, please. That's it, Grand. Um, so what are the signs, for, for those of you on the Tati project, what are the signs that um, your potatoes are getting ready for harvest? Well, not just on the Tati project, if you've got potatoes in your garden. Um, you get different kinds of potatoes. You get main crop potatoes and you get what we call first and second earlies. And first earlies are like your Jersey potatoes, the, the, um, the first potatoes, the, the early potatoes, the new potatoes. And they're ready after about 12 weeks. So Charlotte, the potatoes that everybody's got for the tatty bags are called Charlotte, which is a nice kind of waxy um, seed potato. It's a salad potato, sorry, not a seed potato. And these are second earlies. So they should be about 90 days after planting. But sometimes they'll be quicker than that. Sometimes they'll be slower than that. So the signs to look for is um, wait for your potato to start flowering because if it's starting to flower then that's a sure sign that it's forming those little potatoes in the soil so if you wanted really small tasty potatoes you could rake around in the compost there and get your potatoes out or if you want them to get a little bit longer then or a little bit bigger just wait till they've all finished flowering and maybe give them another week or so you'll notice in the slide here that the bottom leaves on the potatoes are starting to go ever so slightly yellow um, and you'll also see if you look closely that there's like little brown freckles on the leaves. So these are signs that the leaves are getting old and tired and the plant's thinking it's done its business for the year. It's going to die down now. So um, it'll start to flop and it'll start to just look a little bit manky really. So that's time to dig up your potatoes. Um, do it on a sunny day, leave them for a couple of hours on the ground, put them in a sack or a large paper bag unwashed and then you can store them in a cool place. But certainly with new potatoes, it's just get them in your bag, run up to the kitchen, get them in the boiling water as quick as possible and then eat them because they're delicious. Um, if your potato leaves start to get much bigger patches, like you know half of the leaf is going brown, um, then you might have blight. And I suppose most people have heard about the blight because it affected Ireland in the 1800s. Um, and blight is horrible i mean it will literally in 24 hours it'll just attack your entire potato patch the whole lot will collapse and it goes really mushy so if you think you've got blight you've got to act really quickly just cut all the green plant away put it in the bin leave your potatoes in the ground for another week or so so that none of the spores from the fungus get onto the potatoes or you won't be able to store them they'll rot in storage and the uh, most important thing with your potatoes is to remember to weigh them and make a note and send it in to us so that we can see, well, we can read how much weight you've actually produced. So next slide, Ross, is slide seven, I think. Um, harvesting and thinning. So, you know, we're all, the people that have got raised beds are growing a variety of vegetables. You might have beetroot, spring onions, radishes, lettuces, beans. You might have pulled some of them out and you might be onto courgettes or whatever. So different vegetables you can crop them in different ways so um, some of them you can only pick them once like the beetroot when you pull the beetroot out of the soil that's it but things like lettuces and spinach you just keep cutting and coming again and pick them regularly pick the older leaves not the young leaves pick them regularly um, and you're trying to keep the plant young producing all these young leaves if you don't pick it the plant matures and then it just wants to produce seeds and die off so if you if you don't pick them regularly you'll lose them um, courgettes pick them quite early on as well keep looking under the leaves if you miss any they'll turn into working great marrows and you can keep picking courgettes till the frost kills them off beans and peas i know mary you've been wondering when your beans and, and things are ready to pick so 
um, have a feel of the, the pod, the bean pod, and it, it should be turgid. When they, when they first start, they're quite flat, particularly with peas, and then the beans and the peas start to swell up inside them. And as soon as they've occupied all the space inside the bean pod or the pea pod, it will be quite turgid. So if you can press and it gives, then you probably still need to leave it for another couple of days. Give them a good water when they're coming up for harvest. Because that helps them swell the seeds and things. Um, leaves, again, if you're picking them, try and make it a really clean cut. Don't leave bits lying on the ground because that encourages the snails and the slugs and everything. And as Kate said, if they start to send up that central spike, that's them producing seeds. So you probably just pull them out at that point. Root crops, um, when you sow them, try not to sow them too densely because they need space for the root to expand. Um, and you'll find sometimes if you grow them in clumps like I did for you, you'll have three or four maybe in one group. So you would hold on in the picture there, if you hold on to the two smaller beetroot and then take the bigger one in your other hand and gently twist it out, then those two smaller ones should carry on growing and they've got a bit of space to, to grow. Um, if you've planted them too thick and they're just coming up and it's just ridiculous the amount of plants, then you want to thin them. And you need to be quite careful about that because you don't want to disturb the roots of the plants that are growing. So sometimes if it's if they're really tricky to pull out and you're going to pull a whole lot out, just go along with a pair of scissors and cut every alternate set of leaves off right at the soil and that little root will just die back. Um, also, don't just think, right, well, I've picked the radish and throw the leaves away, you know, because if you've got a lot of quite nice young leaves, you could try radish leaf pesto. You know, we were saying at the beginning, you could put beetroot leaves in salad, um, you know, so... Just have a look online and see if there's other things that you can do with your plants because sometimes we throw away things that we could actually be eating. Um, herbs, if you've got herbs in your, your raised bed now, cut them regularly um, keep them going, keep them young. You'll get the nice tasty shoots. Onions and garlic, you'll only get one harvest with them. You'll be, they'll be ready to pick when the leaves fall over. So lift them, dry them off and store them somewhere. They'll be great. And cabbages and cauliflowers, Keep an eye on them, broccoli, when they're starting to ripen because they'll just, they'll, the actual bit that we eat of the broccoli or the cauliflower, that's just actually a flower head. And if we don't pick it at the right time, it just spreads open and it flowers. So um, keep an eye on those. Um, can't think of anything else to say. What was on the slide? Repeat harvest, wait till they're big enough. No, I think I've covered harvesting and thinning. So we're on to slide eight now, Kate, which is bare soil and think about re -sowing. So um, maybe some of you have uh, harvested um, crops already from your raised bed and you actually have a blank, some blank space, which is always exciting. What are you going to put in it? Um, so you had modules of we, um, seedlings that you planted uh, at the start of the project, um, but you now have there's still time enough to sow direct, direct sow, which is, just means you're sowing seed directly into the soil. And there's a list on that slide, which I can't see, of the plants that you could sow direct from seed. Okay. Um, and given that uh, we can now actually buy seed online, you couldn't a couple of months ago, there just was so much demand. Um, all of those crops would be perfectly fine to sow now for growing outside um, and harvesting um, autumn and some of them would go on into, into the winter time. So it's lettuce, baby turnip, pak choy, corn salad, chard and kale. Is your list. A lot of them are leafy things, but um, like the oriental uh, greens, like the um, Chinese cabbage, uh, spinach would last, would be hardy enough to, to survive frosts. Um, baby turnips, obviously, are, are a root crop, so they, but they're also quite hardy to survive frosts. If you're looking into um, next year, and you could also use that um, spare space to um, direct so some some flowering plants, okay, not going to be edible, but if you're wanting to encourage pollinators into your garden, um, now's a great time to sow um, plants such as uh, foxgloves, uh, wallflowers, um, um, night-scented stock, uh, sweet violets, that sort of thing. And you could sow them, I, I must admit, I do tend to sow them into pots and then prick them out, but you could sow them um, into the ground also and then move them into their final space later in the year. And Margaret was reminding me that because we've been shut down for all these months, if you look online, there is still bargains to be had for small plug plants or 
perhaps slightly larger plug plants than the companies uh, were originally intending to sell them as. Um, so you could um, also, if you don't want to go down the seed route, you could look at uh, buying um, plug plants to put in to fill your blank spaces. And we can maybe have a chat about things that you might choose to plant in there. And then the one thing that we talked about, Margaret and I, the other day was growing tatties for Christmas, if you're into the tatty growing thing, yeah. um, is looking for uh, tatties now to plant come August, you have to chip them, grow the little uh, shoots to get them started and then planting. Um, it wouldn't be something you could do outside. You'd need to have them in a pot so you could move them into a more sheltered, frost-free environment. So possibly not for everybody if you don't have that undercover space. Um, so I think we'll probably go to any questions now because that's kind of the interesting bit where we hear what's gone right and what's gone wrong with your gardens. Mm. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that, Margaret. Okay, uh, if I can ask everybody to unmute themselves and uh, put their hands together uh, and give uh, Margaret and Kate a, a round of applause for doing a fantastic job. Yeah. Um, so, it's, it's such a small group. Uh, if you do want to unmute yourself and just ask questions away, uh, it should be able to. Uh, we should be able to manage the all the new people. Lovely. Silence. Silence. I, just, I wanted silence. to ask about courgettes because mine are uh, going great guns now and I've never grown them before. So yeah. um, I know you, you showed us how to uh, to um, merge the flowers so that we get courgettes. How do I know when to pick them or is it just personal choice whether I want a big courgette or a little courgette? Okay. It's, it's very much, it's, oh, it's very much personal choice because um they they will grow remarkably quickly and if they're, as they're outside the more rain you get or the more water you give them uh the quicker they will grow so um i personally i like them a little bit smaller a bit more manageable but um, if you have a big family to feed maybe you want a monster courgette but with most things uh most vegetables are slightly i would say tastier when they're that little bit smaller so i would go for whatever uh, fits your family recipes cooking that's what I would go for. So it's, it's not ever too small to pick or too no, big? I, mean, I guess no, that's what I'm trying to understand. No, it's not ever too small to pick if that works for you. I mean, in restaurants, um, some fancy restaurants will, will pick the courgette flowers and deep fry them. Of course, if you do that, you don't get courgettes from that particular flower because you need the flower to get the mm. courgette fruit. Uh -huh. um, but no, um, whatever whatever suits you, it's, it's never too small. The plant will as long as it's still flowering it will continue to produce more courgettes so i i would go for what if you haven't picked one yet i would go for it and and try it and, and is there too many flowers for one plant to sustain so mine's got about 12 buds at the moment on each courgette plant is it, is it in the ground or is it in a pot it it's in a raised bed it's in the raised bed um i, I must admit i think uh, courgette plants like lots of plants if it isn't getting enough food or water, it will actually just drop flowers and they won't uh, fertilize and become courgettes. So it's, if it's producing flowers, it's probably quite happy and will produce, um, you know, a ton of courgettes. Courgettes are one of those things where in allotments, you know, you, you plant them and anything more than a couple of courgette plants is too many courgette plants, basically, because you just you we just planted four, so we're probably going to be in a oh, with courgettes. Then. A good we didn't know. Yeah, <laughs> no, we're going to your house, no. courgettes. Yeah, I'll share some courgettes. Yeah, they're, they're great. They cover the ground really well. They're very productive, and if you've got a freezer and you can grate and freeze them, you can um, sort of make your produce last longer because you could put it frozen into anything you fancy: stews, spag bowl, anything like that. Okay. So, so yeah, if you, if once if they start getting going and you've given them away to all the people who won't call yet, so I would start freezing them. Grand, thank you. No worries. Good. Good. Can I ask, um, how do you get rid of pests? Because I've started to get slugs and snails eating my lettuce, and I've got little caterpillars that keep on eating my broccoli. Well, slugs and snails, my, uh, my brother-in-law's mother had a brilliant idea. She was a market gardener and she used to go out at night time with a torch and a pair of scissors. And it's very effective. 
um, you might not want to do that, but um, yeah, she just go out with a torch and cut them in half. So oh. <laughs> get rid of them. Um, oh. Yeah, sorry, Mary. I know your Buddhist sensitivity. <laughs> you're slightly offended. Um, sorry about that. Um, slugs and snails. Well, try and keep try and keep the, the hygiene. Try and keep the soil clear you know try not to have wee bits of withered leaf or something like that on the surface of the soil and um, just go carefully around make sure like sometimes you get a pot that's got a rim on it and the snail can hide in there during the day or the slug can hide in there if it's a pot that's on the ground make a point of lifting them up every now and again and checking because slugs always get in under pots and they can stay there all day and then come out at night and munch your things you know and um, if it's a really 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 bad infection you can actually buy these little things called nematodes that you kind of water them into the soil and they attack the slugs and kill them off um, slugs and snails uh, well a friend of mine used to just go around at night time, pick the snails out and throw them across into her neighbor's garden and give them a fighting chance to cross the road on the way back um, I don't know. I, mean, I'm, I'm, I don't believe in putting down slug pellets and, and things like that because, you know, the blackbirds are going to come along and eat this slug and it's full of all this aluminium, whatever it is, that dehydrates it. So, um, I heard about using like coffee grounds. Does that work? I don't know. It could do. I mean, you can buy copper tape and put that around things and that's supposed to help as well. Or you can crush eggshell and put it down. That's supposed to stop them because it makes it a really rough surface for them to go across. Um, I would say don't have anything. If you can, don't have any grassy, weedy patches or other um, leafy borders or anything near there because it's it's somewhere that the slug or the snail can hide during the day and then it can come out at night and do its 10,000 steps and come and get your vegetables mm -hmm. and go back again you know um so we try that um caterpillars there again Mary's not going to like this one best thing is just get a pair of gloves on and pick them off and squish them when they're little if they're big um well it depends how much you want your broccoli leaves but if they eat all the leaves off your broccoli then you're not going to get very much actual broccoli off it. So, um, no, it's, it's, you've got to judge whether you're more wildlife orientated or whether you're more vegetable orientated, I think, really. You could always pick the caterpillars off and put them somewhere else. Um, don't do as I did. When I was a little girl, I went to my neighbours and I helped pick all the caterpillars off the gooseberry bushes and then I left them in a shoebox on our windowsill. The cat jumped up in the windowsill in the middle of the night, knocked the shoebox off the ground, and about a thousand caterpillars just went everywhere, you know. So I, I used you to were popular. Uh, I used to catch the bumblebees. Well, one other thing I mean, for uh, slugs and snails. So, as Marvie says, there's physical oh, control, like physically taking them off. Um, you could just, if you've got a, a, a wild patch of ground somewhere near you, put them in a bucket and go and my dad is always rehoming baby rabbits from his garden up the glen. So he'll catch them and put them up the glen. You could do the same with your slugs and snails if you don't want to squish them. So physical control, removing them. And then um, the other thing to do is, as Margaret says, is remove, making sure that, so quite often they will, I know we've given you a wooden raised bed, but they quite often like hiding round inside you know, sort of just if you've got uh, a lot of stones or wood they, yeah. they like that sort of environment so looking around those areas mm. um and then the other thing uh for the caterpillars is um brassicas particularly is caterpillars are very attractive cabbage white you know all that sort of thing on on your so brassicas are meaning what you just talked about your broccoli so cauliflower kale cabbage and um this is where Gardening companies make their fortune selling you um, nets to net brassica crops. And that's quite often what people would do on, on allotments. If you, if you see sort of hoops and nets, quite often it'd be brassicas underneath. So stopping the butterflies, getting in to lay their eggs and turning into caterpillars and munching your crops. But on a small scale, I think, as Margaret says, the only thing to do is physically take them off. Um, and that will stop them. That, that's that's the only thing. And remember to look on the underside because quite often the eggs are on the underside of the leaves. Or, um, or Mary, get us to come around and take them off for you. <laughs> I haven't had a problem as far as I can see, actually. I Maybe seem to have been okay with... Your birds are getting them. I probably, I feed a lot of birds, mm -hmm. so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, my birds yeah, are probably getting them. My snail's good. And I thought land. of something else with slugs and snails and I've completely forgotten it. My mind has gone blank. But, yeah. That, that's, that's Did you say that, Billy, about snails? My snails go to landfill. All oh, right, okay. 
I suppose if we were in Spain, our France would just would starve them for a day and then eat them, wouldn't we? No, I suppose. I suppose. Oh, that's what's the garlic. Uh, beer traps. So if you, oh you yeah, just, yeah, so you can get something where you just sink like a um, plastic cup or a plastic uh, a waterproof container into the ground with um, you have to the cheapest beer that you've got, um, and um, just sort of a slate over the top, and the beer, the slugs and snails are attracted to the beer, so they go in, and they 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 drown. Obviously, um, it 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 does work, but it's. It's a horrible, slimy mess to get rid of. I mean, it's really uh, stinky. So, you know, that, that's an option. Yeah, that's one possibility. I, I just well, pick them up and put them into landfill. I just start... Mm -hmm. <laughs> put them in the brown bin. <laughs> right, okay. Yeah. yeah. What about salt? I know people that used to sprinkle salt for slugs. Yeah, no, it's a bit cruel, though. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's cruel. Is it, oh, is it cooler than snipping them in half with scissors, then? <laughs> I think putting them half with scissors is probably more instant. You know, when you water them with salt, you dehydrate them, so they just... They, it's it's tiny. Quite a slow... I'm not, I'm not saying that I endorse cutting slugs in half, but I'm just saying that... Um, it certainly works. This lady had a market garden, and that's what she used to do. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 it yeah, yeah. It's effective. A pair of scissors and a torch, Willie, that's what she's doing. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 At that's least bad. Willie sent, sent them away to the tap. Uh, <laughs> I'm recycling them. Uh, so, what else? Um, green fly? You know, sometimes you get little green or black flies on all the junk, juicy shoots and things like that. So, you can just make up some soapy water and spray them with that. Or you could crush some garlic and put it in water and spray your plants with that. That can might help um, but I guess mm -hmm. just keep an eye on things and if you see a build-up of something you can blast it with a spray of water and wash them away or um, just keep your eyes open you know as we said in one of the slides it's it's just observing everything really is the important thing and if it's a hot sunny windy day then you know your plants are going to lose more water than if it's a shady humid day when it's raining or something you know so don't automatically think every monday wednesday friday i'm going to water or um, you know, just look at the environment and just the more you go out in the garden the more you'll see and the more you'll learn so any more questions mm. uh -huh. see on the the tatties uh -huh. mine mine are starting to bud we put ours just in an individual tub which uh -huh. right the, the shaws are huge, and I'm worried now that there's too much shaw and there's not going to be much tatties underneath. Um, but see, once we take them out, mm -hmm. what Kate was saying about putting more in for the winter, could I just take potatoes that sprouted and put them in, and then if I was moving the tub, stick them in the garage when it was colder okay. later on? Could have so, yeah, Kate. Okay. <laughs> So this is probably my, my farming background coming in and I would always, so you're saying, could you reuse some of the tatties that you lifted and replant them for your yeah. Christmas parties? Or, or, or even oh. one from, you know, because I tend to just put them in a basket under the sink. So yeah. sometimes you get them sprouting. And to be uh -huh. honest, one of the tatties that's out there was one like yeah. that. And I thought, I'll chuck it in and see if it comes. Mm -hmm. I guess I guess I'm I guess I'm supporting our Scottish farmers who Scot Scottish farmers produce the bulk of the seed tatties for the whole of the UK because we are so far north the aphids don't get up here and the virus don't get up here so much so mm. I would always I, I, and I guess I'm thinking more from a commercial background it, you will get you will absolutely get tatties from a sprouted tatty from under your sink you might bring in. Uh, black leg or some of the seed borne diseases because that potato was grown for eating rather than seed potatoes. However, mm -hmm. you know, we bought seed tatties for Bannock Burn House and they've come down with black leg also. Um, uh, you know, so <laughs> in an ideal world, you would buy something that said it was a seed potato because it's probably going to be more disease free. So it should give you a better crop. But if you're only after three tatties for a pot, then you can't buy three seed potatoes you can only buy a bag of you know whatever it is two and a half kilos so absolutely if you know it's it's if you're doing it on a large scale you'd always buy the seed tatties if you're doing it to get uh, a harvest for christmas then i'd go for um you know whatever whatever suits um but the, yeah there's a there is a reason why they do all the sort of seed tatty thing um but you know 
if you need to be able to move you like you said you had somewhere you could move your pot under cover is that right yeah yeah so that would be okay because yeah. obviously when the frost when the frost comes or as it gets colder uh tatties outside um the shores would be the tops would be killed off by any frost so it needs to be able to be moved inside yeah. but don't worry that your shores are really tall that just means that um, you should get a really good crop because the more top photosynthesizing doing their thing the more uh, uh, nutrients going down into the soil and so you should get don't worry about the tops getting huge that's a good thing that's a good oh, well. that's good. Well, christmas dinner's looking quite good here we've got potatoes yeah. from Anne, we've got courgettes from gainer and beetroot from Molly, broccoli mm. from sheila beans from mary hi uh, <laughs> amanda you've been growing anything not yet I've been trying to grow um, tomatoes rather unsuccessfully, but mm -hmm. it's my first go, so right. learning some information here. <laughs> What's unsuccessful about them? Um, they've got waterlogged oh, and right. all okay. day, so I've been tipping out the pots every night to get rid of all that excess water, but they're just, mm -hmm. the leaves just aren't looking that great now. I think they've got too wet and too damp, so I'm trying to dry them off. Uh-huh, okay. So. Yeah, there's been quite a lot of rain recently, hasn't there? And, and it really, the first couple of months, it was great if you were growing tomatoes outside, but it's not so good now because yeah. the nighttime temperature is just that wee bit cool. Mm -hmm. um, but it might, we might get a school holidays, isn't it? We might get a, a warmer autumn as the, by the time the school go back, maybe we'll get some. Yeah. 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 So, any other issues, Mary? No? No, mm, fine. Good. So, and everything's growing well. Yeah. It has been, yeah. mostly, hasn't it? Your stuff has been good. Hi. So, what about you, Ross? Do you grow anything? Ah, uh, well, I've been reading my garden. So, I've just recently actually built a raised bed. Uh, so, I had a lot of strawberries in there. Uh, well, right. in lots of pots. So, I've transplanted them into the raised bed, but I built it quite large. Uh, so, what I've done is, uh, I forget the name, I think it's something like called Hugo Culture. But I just went into the woods and I got loads of logs and I filled up the majority with that. But what I've been noticing is with the heavy rains, a lot of the soil has been cracking or subsiding almost. Uh -huh. But I guess my problem has been, well, what my question was going to be is, I've only recently done it, so what can I plant the now that would crop? But you already answered that in the last slide. But uh, the birds have been getting out all my strawberries. They were looking really good. And then I went to go and pick them and they're all gone. <laughs> Well, I'm upset at that, so I'm thinking nets uh, over the raised bed, but uh, any other suggestions, maybe? A gun? No. A gun. Stuff you need to protect. You need, because it's, it's, like, it's like a sweetie shop for all the birds. Um, even if you could do it, that's why you're probably best having them sort of together in one area, because you could use, where well, you could use canes to make a structure or even better is if you've got some flexible pipe like the blue alkathene pipe for water pipes or a met you know a piece of metal you could bend uh, to make hoops and then fruit cage netting there's really no way around it unfortunately um because it is it's like a sweetie shop um well, for birds and uh, then that's maybe at least meant a nice i like having my bird feeder outside because uh i got all the birds there but it's attracting a lot of rats and mice. Mm. Is there a way uh, mm. and to, to uh, keep one without the other, or do I just get rid of the bird feeder and get rid of the mice? Or um, if, if it depends what you. I must admit, for bird feeding, I've it, for, gone for the just like the some. It's more expensive, but there's less waste. Is the sunflower hearts because then there's very little ends up on the floor. You know, like mm. birds are chucking, when it's a mixed seed and they chuck out everything and then there's stuff on the floor for the mice and the rats. So that might be, maybe you have to maybe give it a bit of a rest and then when you start, maybe start restart feeding, go for yeah. um, for something where then they don't chuck out the stuff they don't like. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, it's really difficult. Uh, so I uh, agree, I'm going to have to try things. But yeah, that's a good way to yeah. Go. One of my friends recommended for um, netting is if you've got any old like greenhouse, you know, like the plastic greenhouses, if the plastic's seen better days, but you've still got the poles and the fittings, oh, you yeah. can cut down the poles to make a frame with those. So I'm on the lookout for any old greenhouse poles that anyone has, because um, my greenhouse is still in one piece. So that scuppered me because I don't have um, 
old poles but if anyone has any from a, an old plastic greenhouse that's seen better days I'd love to recycle them for you. I'm going through <laughs> a lot of the marquees, old marquees at the oh, yeah. house uh, to get that cleared up for the uh, the toilets uh, gainer so uh, they've got the wee connections thing so you can just run a thing over that so yeah because you can cut them. the poles to make the perfect length for your veg bed and just lift it up and over as and when you need it so you don't need to worry about doors in meshing and things like that you can just create a good frame so yeah I'm, I'm up for recycling those for you <laughs> you know me I'll take anything for free yeah um I think we're probably getting to the end of the call because there's only the, there's so few of us here just now but I was just thinking because this is a recording if anybody's got questions that they want answered if they just send them in maybe on the Facebook page or would they send them to Sheila or Ross what do you think if people send them in and we can try and help them yeah, can do. Yeah, yep. I can put a wee, yeah. put a wee email out um, to everybody, even as the people that didn't um, didn't come along today. Or are you going to send the video out to everybody, Ross? Yeah, yeah, I've got that a few bits of the video to do, and so I'll uh, send this out to everybody, and then I'll just tag along with the email that I send out. Any questions uh, on your raised bed? Ross, Ross, does it go on the website as well? Uh, we can put it up on the website. I um, Once a new market person begins, uh, we can get that to them and they can get it uploaded on the website, will they? Yep. Right. Because it's a, I think it's a really useful useful uh, morning and what do you call it for all the new people who are, uh -huh. or new people to go and plant some things like that. Mm -hmm. I think it's a fantastic thing. So I think uh, it would benefit a lot of people. So. Good, good. Um... Well, certainly for anyone that's been growing the potatoes, I hope they've enjoyed doing it. And people that have got raised beds, it seems. Oh, it's like super. Success. I've enjoyed the raised beds. That's Chuffy good. Bed. Oh, okay. Chuffy well, bed. Right, you have to plan next year's raised bed then. And, <laughs> and as Kate said, you know, don't leave the soil empty. See what you could put in Stop. over the winter. You know, you could go to the supermarket and get some herb plants. You could get chives. You could get oh, what, what would last over the winter? Maybe rosemary. You might get a couple of little rosemary bushes in, or you could put some thyme in, maybe or something like that. You know, and then at least you you can nip out, get some parsley, get that growing, and then you can nip out the back door and get your herbs oh. when you're cooking. Does anybody anybody want parsley? I've got loads of parsley. <laughs> no, it's not that. It worked for us. We've got that. Uh, I've got a massive bay bush as well. Which All started right. off as a tiny, tiny little plant, uh -huh. and it's now huge. Right. So I've got loads of bay leaves. If anybody needs some, God. <laughs> Christmas dinner is right. definitely looking good. Oh. <laughs> Probably no. for pudding as well. I just want wants to, to grow stuff over the winter, um, so it's yes. just suggestions for that really. Um, oh, leeks, if you can get leek plants just now. Leeks oh, and that would be a good idea. It might well, be getting towards the end of actually being able to get hold of plants, but maybe if you go online, you could get some mm. young leek plants. And uh, what about what about um, parsnips and turnips, Margaret? Turnips, I think Katie can probably plant them just now, can't he? Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I'm I'm still on a white screen. I can't see anybody. So yeah, turnips is particularly if you go for um, the baby ones like uh, snowball or. It sounds a bit bizarre, but gold, gold ball is apparently one that's really good as baby turnips. So, yeah, you could absolutely go for turnips, sowing turnips um, from seed now. Yes. You might get beetroot. And kohlrabi, that's another thing you can grow at this time of year. Um, I, I'm trying that for the first time, and I think it's kind of like a turnip. But you uh -huh. can eat it and cook it and things like that. So you could, you could grow that just now and start it off. It's like a kind of brassica. It's, it's related to the cabbages and things like that. Mm. Certainly, if you get some cold rabbi seeds and start them, it's not too late for that. And do, do cucumbers, do they grow over the winter, Margaret? No, not unless you've got a heated greenhouse. Right, they're, okay. They're, they're like courgettes, you know, they're quite um, soft plants. Uh, and oh, right. Fleshy and things. Well, um, anything, anything, any suggestions for the winter stuff would be appreciated. Mm -hmm. um, what else would you do just now at this time of year? Let's think. Spring onions, I suppose. Um, parsnips. Oh take quite a long time to grow so really they needed to be in the ground kind of March April. Mm. Um, I think your turnips probably your best bet. Leeks if you can get them. Celery bring, have been in the yeah. ground before now. If anybody wants spring onions I'll bring them up next week. <laughs> I'll, um, no I've got an abundance of them so. I think you've Would cheated you... Willie. I think you've just gone to the supermarket and bought great big bundles of things and stuffed them in your, <laughs> no, in your no, no. Well, this is it. This is 
this is the third time I've thinned them out. So, boom. Oh, well, I'll give you my raised bed any time. There is nothing growing in it. So, uh, definitely got a dodgy batch of compost. Nah, listen, I'll have to leave you. I'll have yeah, to leave you. I'll have to go as well. Uh, um, good. Well, only... Thank you for joining us. No, thanks, everyone. That's been good. Thanks, Kate. Great. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you. I thank need you to go as well. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. I'll see you. Thank you. Possibly later. Yeah.